Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Ph.D., is a professor emeritus of nutritional biochemistry at Cornell University, USA. For more than 40 years, Dr. Campbell has been at the forefront of nutrition research. Dr. Campbell is the project director of the China Oxford Cornell Diet and Health Project, which eventually became known as the China Study, considered the most comprehensive analysis of the role of diet, disease and health ever conducted. In 2004, Dr. Campbell and his son Tom co-authored the book The China Study, which summarizes his research in nutrition and concludes that a pure, vegan, meaning animal-free diet, is optimal for human health. So what we found was that as soon as people start to go from the counties where there's no animal-based foods up to the level where there is some, mm -hmm. that's when you start to see blood cholesterol levels come up. You start to see cancer start to appear mm -hmm. and increase start to see heart disease more, you start to see the kind of disease that we see in the West. And that was really quite striking. What evidence is there that whole food, plant-based diet can actually reverse chronic disease? Well, we had acquired information that uh, using certain kinds of nutrients characteristic of animal or plant food, that we could actually reverse cancer or at least control it in an experimental setting. Uh, then I came to know Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Jr at the Cleveland Clinic, who uh, had done something very similar with people. And now he's published a book himself uh, just in February on reversing heart disease. And what he was able to achieve was something truly remarkable. He was taking seriously ill people with heart disease and actually just bringing the disease under control. He actually calls it cure. And what he, what he ended up doing was very similar to another man by the name of Dr. Dean Ornish. Uh, the evidence now shows that we can reverse or at least control heart disease. There's quite a lot of evidence now beginning to emerge that we can control even cancer. Experimentally, we could do that. We got to a point where we could turn on and turn off cancer development just by giving animal protein, for example, or taking it away or replacing it with plant protein. It's quite remarkable. Amazing. We do have some human studies now from other laboratories, other, other researchers who are uh, basically demonstrating that uh, cancer can be controlled to some extent. Do we really need a lot of protein in our diet? And does a vegetarian diet provide all the vital nutrients that our bodies require? What we're now seeing, at least what my research is showing, is that excessive amounts of protein, if we start consuming protein in excess of what we need, cholesterol levels in our blood starts to rise. Atherogenic uh, lesions that lead to heart disease starts to increase. We get an acidity that then pulls calcium from the bones. We, we, get, we start growing cancers. And so the question is we can't consume excess protein. The question then becomes, what's excess? Well, the amount of protein we need is about eight to 10 percent of total calories. Most of us, 95 percent of us in our society consume somewhere in considerably in excess of that. We consume between about 11 and 25 percent or so. And so we put ourselves at risk by doing that. And uh, plant-based foods, a good plant-based diet, vegetables, fruits, grains, has just about 8 to 10 percent protein. It's, it's, I mean, nature almost made it so that it was ideal. A key finding in both the China Project and Dr. Campbell's research is that excess animal protein is a potent trigger for cancer growth and other diseases. In addition, in the case of breast cancer, he recognizes the role of excess estrogen, which also arises from animal proteins and milk in particular. Well, what are the factors that lead to breast cancer? And how can a plant-based diet reduce those risks? Breast cancer is, uh, like other cancers and other diseases, very complex from a biological perspective. And unfortunately, over the years, we've studied that as various factors that might be related in isolation. So we've learned some things, you know, and, and, but uh, it's quite controversial and debatable if people focus on these individual studies and individual entities. When, however, you put all this together in a more holistic kind of interpretation and look at things collectively, it becomes quite clear to me that breast cancer is a disease of the West. Uh, that's been noted by many people. Breast cancer begins to emerge as we start consuming more animal-based foods, especially dairy. Dairy food 
uh, has cer certain characteristics with it that uh, when especially young people, in this case uh, young girls, are consuming dairy, for example, to hopefully to get stronger bones and teeth and grow faster, as the ads have indicated, they actually then reach age at medical or reproductive lives earlier. Boys, I'm sure, do the same thing, but we know we have better data for girls. So they reach age of medical earlier, their circulating estrogen levels are higher, they remain, remain high as long as they consume that kind of diet, they stop the reproductive life later, they have a longer period, more estrogen exposure, all in large measure related to the kind of diet they're consuming. So I would argue that uh, as far as food is concerned, uh, animal food is a problem, especially dairy food. I, I think we should just simply not be feeding dairy food to our young people and all older people either. Plant food also has a protective effect. We know the dietary fiber and certain and phytochemicals and things like this in plant foods, we know that they also tend to repress you know, the growth of cancer you know, or cells that would behave like breast cancer cells. So it means being a total vegan, essentially, you know, to really uh, get to the lowest possible risk for breast cancer. You know, we are. We're the only species on the face of the planet that continues to consume milk beyond the so-called weaning period. The indigestible protein in cow's milk actually causes a negative chain reaction in the bodies of infants, children, and adults. Uh, because the protein, in reality, stimulates the growth of cells and the growth of the body and the growth of cancer cells, you know, faster, let's say, than other proteins. Animal proteins tend to do that. And the, so it's the protein of the milk that seem to cause so many problems. Protein also does some other things, too. When, for example, it's not completely digested down to its constituent amino acids, and, and maybe there's little little uh, chains of amino acids that are remain undigested. We call them peptides. Those things get absorbed into the blood, especially in an infant. And they look like foreign proteins, which they are. And so our bodies produce antibodies against them, which are very specific for just those that string of amino acids. And then those antibodies turn around and find the same string of amino acids in the cells of the pancreas that's responsible for producing insulin. So the antibodies being produced against this foreign protein in turn, turn against, you know, a, a similar sequence of amino acids in the pancreas and therefore destroy it. And then that leads to type one diabetes. Dr. Campbell explains that the main reason modern physicians and society at large are unaware of the profound benefits of a plant-based diet is the tendency to study aspects of health in isolation. Science itself in medicine is focused on reducing things down to its, to its details and then attempting to take these details of individual chemicals or individual nutrients or individual diseases or individuals. I mean, they, they really focus, focus, focus. And that, to me, is not really what medicine should be. That's not health. Health, and particularly nutrition, is um, a condition that is very holistic, comprehensive effects. I, I'm a biochemist by training. And if you could sort of crawl inside the cell, which I feel like I, I can do from time to time, you start looking at all these reactions. And it's like a symphony. It's like a beautiful symphony. You know, countless things are coming together to actually create a kind of dynamic, a highly integrated dynamic that leads to health if we give it the right resources. If we give it the wrong resources, we don't, we don't get that. It's, it's, uh, it's really quite a beautiful story. By eating a healthy, nutrient-dense, plant-based diet, we can actually overcome or avoid our genetic tendencies. This concept is supported by the joint work of medical clinician Dean Ornish, MD, and visionary scientist and genome expert J. Craig Venter, PhD, who found that gene expression can be altered through lifestyle changes, including a diet very high in plant-based foods. Another observation that we worked on for a long time was that disease does not occur uh, just because of the genes we have. I mean, genes do play some role. It, it, here's the way it is. All these biological reactions, 
whether they're normal physiological or whether they're pathological, all these reactions begin by chemically speaking. They begin with genes. Mm -hmm. Right. But eat there, and we have you know about twenty five thousand genes in all kinds of combinations. It's an enormously complex system. Right, right. And and they and these genes all work together. So everything starts with genes. And in a biochemical sense, these genes, DNA in this case, uh, if you will, they produce uh, what we call RNA. The RNA then produces protein, mm -hmm. and the protein becomes the enzymes. Right. So, and then the enzymes is what's creating and controlling, you know, the events that subsequently turn into either health or disease. Mm -hmm. So we start with genes. Everything starts with genes. And uh, but. And also, we have some genes. All of us have some genes that aren't so good, right. and they'll take they us down the wrong path. The, the question is: do, do, Does our disease occur because of the genetic background? Mm. Very little or none. Because even if we have some troublesome genes, either from our background or from genes that have been corrupted during our lifetimes, if we have these kind of genes, they can give rise to some disease. We can control the expression of these genes. That means we can control whether or not they do produce RNA, whether they do produce protein, or whether they do produce uh, enzymes. Well, of course. So you know, even though the thing starts with genes, and that's a popular understanding, that's not what determines disease. What determines disease is the control of that genetic expression to give you know, health or disease at the other end. Right. That's a very exciting concept, because that what that means is instead of I mean, if we rely on the idea that genetics causes disease, that's a very fatalistic idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we rely in, instead on the idea that we control the expression of these diseases through nutrition, mm -hmm. that's where nutrition comes into play. Mm -hmm. If we can do it through nutrition, that's a very hopeful sign. Right, right. We can do it for ourselves. And now we know what kind of nutrition it is. Right. Plant-based diet creates health prevents disease, and the benefits are enormous, especially in terms of the control of health care costs. Health care costs can be reduced substantially if, for example, everyone were to switch over to a whole foods plant-based diet. His extensive studies brought about Dr. Campbell's conclusion that an animal-free diet would be most beneficial to our well-being. I've just come to a, a very different worldview. Uh, it's a worldview that is based on holistic ideas. And uh, so I finally got to the place where I was saying that the closer we get to a plant-based diet, you know, the healthier we're going to be. Dr. Esselstyn is a pioneer in the use of a pure plant-based diet to help heart patients regain happy, healthy lives. From 1968 to the present, he has worked at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, USA. He is also past president of the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons, became the first recipient of the Benjamin Spock Award for Compassion in Medicine in 2005, and has been listed as one of the best physicians in the United States. His greatest contribution to the health sciences started when he began a 20-year peer-reviewed study which found that a plant-based diet can help heart disease patients. His findings are summarized in his book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. I think it had proved several things. We had proved that patients who were severely ill with heart disease, when properly instructed, uh, would be willing to adopt to a, a significant lifestyle change that would not only eradicate their disease, but would also achieve reversal, as we'll see, that these patients also were willing to change, not for f three months, not for one year, but actually to do this uh, really for the rest of their lives. Because the thing that became so powerful in the eyes of the patients, their aware awareness was the fact that, uh, look, I have now become the locus of control for this disease. Because there's nothing that a patient with heart disease or who's had a previous heart attack fears more than when is the other shoe going to fall? When do I get the next heart attack? The families feel the same way. But just imagine how powerful it is when they recognize, when they continually follow this type of plant-based nutrition, the all the, that all that inflammation, all that formation of these ugly 
uh, fatal plaques in their arteries is going to cease, diminish, resolve, go away, uh, and they're there. Dr. Esselstyn believes the key is in informing people about the risk factors contributing to heart disease. Why are we asking everybody to know about risk factors? Because we're all being exposed to something that is putting it at such tremendous risk that eventually we're all going to have this uh, horrible disease, which is absolutely crazy when we see other cultures on the planet that don't even have this. So obviously, obviously the answer is, listen, stop eating the foods that give you this disease. And not only do you not get the disease, but if you've got the disease, it's a marvelous treatment for it, and it can stop it from extending. What it really requires for the public is just simply the knowledge that this hideous disease, our number one killer, it need never exist. And if it does exist, it need never ever uh, progress. Throughout history, there have been entire cultures that have literally lived for generations and generations without ever having this type of disease. And that is with plant-based nutrition. And I think to use that knowledge and that skill and employ it now for patients who have been devastated by this disease is entirely appropriate because they then become the locus of control for this disease. Right now, we have this peculiar way of treating the, the disease where we don't treat the disease. We use a thing called angioplasty. If you get a narrowing, we try to come in with a balloon and blow it up. Wow. Or we try to bypass it. They don't treat the disease. They are what we call sort of stopgap. Even the persons that do these procedures will agree that these are sort of a stopgap patch job. And the sad thing is, with stents and with angioplasty and with the bypass, with the passage of time, there is an erosion of the benefits, and the whole process is extremely expensive. But when you're simply switched to eating plant-based foods and you do it correctly, there is no morbidity or complications to the diet. You don't die from the diet. Uh, there's no added expense because you've got to eat. And the most exciting thing of all is that the benefits do nothing but continue to improve, not erode. Wow. Dr. Esselstyn explains the foundations of a healthy plant-based diet, which proves to be sufficient in meeting nutritional protein requirements. When people first start this way, they can yeah. understand the causation of heart disease. They can understand that that the small changes in, in how you eat immediately destroy the capacity of the artery to cause all this nasty inf inflammation, which is causing the disease. The constant question we get is, how am I going to get my protein? Well, you're never going to be deficient in protein if you're eating a wonderful variety of whole grains, all the different sort of wonderful types of beans, vegetables, and fruit, especially the key here for patients who, for instance, who have chest pain or angina, they have to get their green leafy vegetables. In your experience in 20 years of counseling patients to, to go to this plant-based diet, has anyone ever had a protein deficiency? No, not in our experience with what we've done. There is the misconception that fish is a healthy meat alternative, but many studies have shown that fish absorb all the contamination in our waterways. So fish flesh is laced with toxins such as mercury, PCBs, DDT, dioxins, lead, arsenic, and a range of other chemicals. Warnings have been issued about the toxins found in fish flesh, and countless research has shown that consuming contaminated fish can have serious health consequences. A piece of muscle, whether it paws with a hoof, flaps away, or wiggles a fin. All muscle is made up of animal protein, animal cholesterol, animal fat, none of which we really want our patients to have. Fish is this whole business about uh, omega-3 yep. uh, fatty acids. And uh, we really are not basically deficient in uh, omega-3 uh, fatty acids. How does the fish get omega-3? From the algae. I'm not saying that our patients are going to get algae, but you can certainly get green leafy vegetables and by uh, utilizing flaxseed meal, uh, this is going to give us the omega-3 we need.
According to Dr. Esselstyn, the medical profession is seeing changes where doctors are increasingly interested in learning more about nutrition to better assist their patients towards a more healthful lifestyle. Just in the last uh, 18 months, I've had invitations from six different medical schools. Even though this has been going on 20 years, what happened, all these academic institutions are now beginning to really grasp and want to uh, take advantage of this. We have to have a seismic revolution in health. The seismic revolution in health that is going to occur is going to come when we in medicine have the skill and the fortitude and the will to share with the public what is the healthiest lifestyle so they never have to have these common chronic killing diseases. If you're eating plant-based, how are you going to have obesity? How are you going to get diabetes? How are you going to get hypertension? How are you going to get strokes and heart disease, the common Western cancers, and on and on and on it goes. So there's, a, there's an increasing awareness of the power of this for the com most common killer, which is heart attacks, cardiovascular disease. Dr. Esselstyn reveals how brain health is also affected by our diet. Let's just take one other uh, organ that I, uh, that I think I'd like to sh talk about for okay. a moment. And that is the, uh, the brain. I mean, we've talked about the heart, but nothing is quite as important. Because we all, knew, we all know, know now, for instance, that by, by age 85, 50% uh, of Americans have dementia. Well, who wants to have a successful life and look forward to that? And uh, there's been some very interesting developments. We know from the, the work of uh, Megan Cleary uh, and her team of radiologists from the West Coast, when they reported in 2001, in February, at the stroke meetings in Miami, that she and her team had looked at over 11,000 MRIs of the brains of Americans. Uh, that is a magnetic resonance image. And what they began to find is that at age 50 in Americans, they begin to see little white spots. What you're looking at here is a nice normal brain MRI. The only white spots you see here are the uh, cerebral ventricles, which have cerebral spinal fluid, and that's normal. But it's a nice sort of uniformly dark area. Now, these little white spots that they are beginning to see in Americans at age 50, we now know are little strokes. Whether you're driving your car, playing tennis, sleeping, zappo, little stroke. Not a problem, right? Because the brain's got a lot of reserve and the stroke is small. But if you continue to eat the same way and the same lifestyle, now you're 65. And you may find yourself more often than not saying, uh, sweetheart, where did I leave the car keys? And now you just continue to eat the same way, and you're 75. And you find yourself, more often than not, saying, uh, sweetheart, where did I leave the car? <laughs> and now, if you continue to eat the same way, and you're 85, you may uh, uh, look at her and say, uh, are you my sweetheart? <laughs> So they so, recognized a correlation between diet and and strokes and yeah. stroke. So wow. here you here you oh have somebody. Gosh. I think you can see the uh, the difference in, wow. in in these two. In this one, I actually have counted over ninety of these little uh, uh, strokes. But you can just imagine if a brain has all these multiple little strokes and scar tissue, how can all those beautiful uh, messages get through in a coordinated fashion. And so we think that there can be a great deal lessening of the problems of, uh, uh, of senile dementia when people begin to eat uh, plant-based. And not only do they save the vessels in their heart, but they also save the vessels in their brain. The same is true of your legs and your uh, kidneys and, and everything else. All the vessels in the body are, are helped. So it sounds like there's a lot of medical research now that is proving that a plant-based diet can not only prevent diseases, but um, elongate your health. Is that true? The main thing is uh, not to have this long period of 
chronic debilitating uh, diseases and illness that need never occur. And I think this is the, uh, the, the, the thing that we're constantly striving for is equality. This is Dr. Crow's uh, at the time of his heart attack here. And then we see 30 months later uh, what he had done without any operation or without any drugs. Wow. Just his own, uh, his own biochemistry that was so changed when he began uh, fully eating plant-based and kept his cholesterol, as you know, well under 150 and his bad LDL uh, under 80. And that was my excitement and reason for wanting to, uh, to uh, write this book. People who feel healthy um, and have no history of heart disease, would you still recommend them to have a plant-based diet to switch to that? Dr. Culler from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, who as a result of his cardiovascular health study had said that all males who are 65, all females who are 70, who have been exposed to the traditional Western diet have uh, cardiovascular disease and should be treated as such. So even the person that asks you that question at age 50, let's say it's a woman who's 50 who is uh, pretty good uh, health and uh, what she's eaten uh, the typical Western diet. I've told you already from the autopsy studies of those between the ages of 16 and 34 that that woman who is asking me the question already has a certain amount of disease. More recently, the world-famous Framingham study out of Boston, uh, near, near Boston, made an observation of people in the village of Framingham that they had a thousand people who had normal blood pressure at age 50. Those same people by age 70, 90% were now hypertensive, had high blood pressure. And uh, so the plant-based nutrition is wonderful to help control hypertension, especially when you eliminate uh, the salt. We thank Dr. Esselstyn for his remarkable work and research in how to maintain our health through a plant-based diet. May you enjoy overall well-being through a nutritious vegan diet. <laughs>